Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. And her voice sounds a little different. <laughs> Everybody in the office here at Scared to Death uh, has a cold, has a big head cold. So. Welcome, welcome to the sickness edition. Welcome to the infirmary. Um, do you have any announcements for us today? Uh, look at this set. That's my announcement. That's, I know. Yeah, Logan and Ollie, his son, oh my they came God. in and read it. If you, uh, we're gonna have to post it on socials, but also on the for the YouTube viewers, they made this really cool scared to death Christmas village. Like uh, I think it's like Spoopyville. Uh huh. Welcome to Spoopyville. Yep, little custom sign there and everything. I mean, it oh is God. pretty elaborate. So well done. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome. I love the the TLC. Uh, Logan's been given everything, and yeah. Yeah, 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 like all the little extra accoutrements to the set, and Tyler's been tweaking with the lighting. So and much. Yeah, so we hope that you guys have been noticing uh, small but awesome improvements in the show. Absolutely. All right, and then you have announcements. Yeah, well, and you had the the number for the um, charity, right? Oh, yeah, but normally you start, oh, yeah. and then okay. I do charity. You can tell just, that we're sick because we're out of it. Yeah, I was, just gonna, I was just switching it up today, like for huh. variety. Oh, you, yeah, you just didn't give me a heads up on that. Okay. <laughs> I can be ready. Yeah. Okay, sure, no problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, our charity this month, uh, as always, in November, we do a Veterans Day charity, uh, or uh, a Veterans Charity in honor of Veterans Day. And this year, we donated to the United Heroes League, and uh, they provide free sports equipment, game tickets, and uh, skill development camps, and various things of that nature to military families and their kids. We donated $15,228 to the UHL, and another $1,692 dollars has been added to the scholarship fund stay tuned in january for details about the scholarship fund yeah thanks so much for letting us do these cool things yeah it's incredible and now and now Lindsay is holding these awesome bookmarks we oh have my god these jumbo bookmarks yeah in the bad magic store this oh. week these deluxe jumbo bookmarks very occulty oh the logan has made very thick and velvety each set comes with six different bookmarks designed to resemble the pages of an ancient witch's text perfect stocking stuffer for the holidays they're very unique the back uh, has uh, your book cover on it. Yeah. Which Logan designed many moons ago. Also in the store, uh, new merch from Casco. I forgot about that random <laughs> joke scenario I made a few weeks ago. Uh, a Costco type store that sold caskets. Uh, also had random people handing out free snacks. Logan did not forget. So you can get a Casco tea or hoodie to show your support for the world's leading wholesale casket manufacturer. So you can head over to badmagicmerch.com to check all this stuff out. Awesome sauce. And then what new uh, fan-submitted horror do you have for us? Well, this week, I haven't done this in a while. I just have one big, oh, fat, nice. juicy, long tail. Cool. Uh, possibly a curse and yeah. possibly cursed with the hat man. Okay. We haven't seen him in a while. You haven't heard from the hat man in a yeah. bit. Well, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I have uh, a bigger story set right here in Idaho. Ooh. Boise's Murder House, a.k.a. the Chop Chop House. That already doesn't sound good. Somewhat recent true crime history leads to numerous reported paranormal encounters, so very creepy story that I was unfamiliar with. And then I'll share a bit of a tragic lore revolving around rural Colorado's Third Bridge, a.k.a. Ghost Bridge, and some reports of modern encounters there as well. All right. So not strange geographically too far from where we record for both of today's tales. All right, all right, all right. Uh, you want to, uh, is it possible for you to show your cozy socks while I... Uh, get get ready for the possible. first story. I'm working on new moves over here to show off my socks. <laughs> I'm already like bundled up. I'm freezing. Got a fever. It's fine. I got these fuzzy guys, and they're so cute. You guys, I know nobody likes it when I double sock, but that's how cold my feet are. So don't mind me with my socks on socks. Look at these little guys. Oh, very cute. Hello, little fluffy guys. All right, we'll get cozy. Hope they keep you safe today. Uh, headed to someplace a lot closer to home than usual with this first one. Going to share some disturbing true crime history before I get into the paranormal scares. Just over a seven-hour drive or around 450 miles away from where we record each week sits a house that few people would mistake for an ordinary home. 
If you happen to drive past the house at 805 West Linden Street in Boise, Idaho and take a peek, you'll see what I mean. Currently covered in a layer of what looks like dust and dirt with some windows broken and boarded up and trash strewn about the yard, the two-story 2,700 square foot craftsman style home that looks like an abandoned horror movie set in the most p- recent pictures that we could find. Uh, a fitting look. Some of the events that have taken place there could easily come straight from a horror movie screenplay, but the events were real. These events would give the home two grim nicknames, the first being the Boise Murder House and the second being the more gruesome Chop Chop House. Yeah, I don't like that. With a name like that, you might think that the house was once home to some brutal frontier era crime as is the case with Iowa's uh, Velisca Axe Murder House. But in fact, the events that warped the Chop Chop House's legacy forever happened surprisingly recently. Just over 35 years ago, in the early morning hours of June 30th, 1987, 37-year-old Daniel Rogers and 31-year-old Darren Cox were arguing with 21-year-old Preston Murr in the basement of Rogers' home, in the basement of the house now known as the Chop Chop House. The three men had been hanging out earlier that evening trying to locate Roger's recently stolen guns. They'd driven around Boise trying to find the apartment of the person whom they believed stole the guns, but no luck. All of them were in a terrible mood when they returned back to Linden Street, and they quickly began to argue once they got back to the house. Accusations were thrown around that one of them had stolen the guns or at least helped someone else steal them. Around midnight, their argument reached a fever pitch, and things got violent. A gun was fired, Preston was shot in the shoulder, Preston, now bleeding profusely, tried to escape. He fled the home, ran to a nearby house where he banged on the neighbor's door, yelling for help. But no one answered. Another neighbor, hearing the pounding on the door, just bam, 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 grabbed his phone to call the police. And then as the line connected, the pounding stopped. Let go of me! The neighbor heard someone scream. Then there was a sound. Later described, uh, later court documents described it as an anguished yell. But to the neighbor, it sounded like the howl of an animal, the last frightened sound of a creature who knew it was trapped. Peeking out of his window, looking into their poorly lit yard, the neighbor saw a dark figure now chasing Preston. Then he saw a hand reach out from the shadows and grab the 21-year-old roughly by the arm, proceed to drag him back inside the house next door. Once inside, Preston would be taken down into the basement, where he would be fatally shot in the back of the head. Daniel and Darren would then use an axe and a knife to dismember his corpse. His body was cut into 26 pieces. Oh my God! Which must have taken some time. And that is the source of the home's nickname. Chop, 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 chop. The men then drove to the Idaho-Oregon border to dump the body parts in the Brownlee Reservoir. Though police were called again the next morning, the neighbor who didn't answer when Preston knocked grabbed uh, or asked officials to come investigate the blood he found on a screen door. The police would find blood on much more than that door. They found blood throughout the neighborhood. On sidewalks, the street, at least one neighboring house, The scene painted a picture of someone wounded who was literally hunted down. It's unclear what happened to the house in the immediate years after Rogers was sent to the Idaho State Correctional Center to serve out a life sentence, and Cox was sent away to serve six years after being offered a deal for cooperating with the investigators and testifying against Rogers. But property records available online list a new owner, James Howell, who's had the property since 2000. Howell has rented the house to a number of tenants over the years, and given its proximity to Boise State University— It's become a popular choice among students seeking off-campus housing. In other words, it's been rented to young people often looking for their first ever apartment, looking for a good deal. Young people who may not know the dark history of the home or who may not care. Let's explore some of these alleged sightings. Time now for the tale of the Chop Chop House. One group of fraternity brothers who lived in the house together went on record saying that on numerous occasions, when they went down into the basement, they saw blood dripping down the walls. Others who spent time in the basement described the space as feeling off. They couldn't put their finger on exactly how the space felt off. It just felt wrong somehow. Bad energy. Someone identifying herself as Christy W. said that one night walking past the place as a little kid, she saw a woman in an upstairs window banging on it from the inside. Looked like this woman was scared and screaming, but Christy couldn't hear anything. She said she can still recall the incident as if it happened yesterday. Another person going by the pseudonym D., told of a much more intense experience. Dee said that he and some friends had just moved in when this happened. They hadn't even moved all their stuff out of the boxes. Several boxes and pieces of furniture were still sitting out on the front porch. Dee was upstairs in one of the bedrooms with a friend, this was late in the evening, when the two heard someone walk up the stairs. At first, Dee thought it was his roommate. But then he and his roommate were talking to one another when they heard it again. They both did. They clearly heard someone walk up the steps. 
They stopped talking and listened carefully. And when they didn't hear anyone walk back down, they became concerned. Curious who else was in the house with them, they went to check it out. Dee was worried that someone had broken into the house, and for a brief moment he was certain someone had broken in when he saw what he thought was their shadow. Then he quickly realized that the shadow wasn't attached to anyone. It was moving about on its own. Hoping his eyes were playing tricks on him, Dee and his roommate now decided to go stand on the front porch. If anyone was inside the house, they didn't want to be stuck inside with them. But also, if whoever broke in tried to leave, they wanted to be able to see who they were to be able to report them to police. It was late when all this was going on, around midnight. The moon was bright and the sky was particularly clear. Now in the moonlight, Dee swore he saw a blurry human-sized shape moving around in the corner of his vision. A moment later, his friend said, Are you seeing that too? The two now stepped off the porch and out onto the lawn, unsure of what to do next. They couldn't decide if they should go back into the house or not. Both hoped they'd just gotten each other riled up over nothing. They were in a new house, new neighborhood, and the moonlight and the eerie quiet of everyone else in the area being asleep could make just about any place feel or look creepy. But then when they both noticed movement above them, when they turned to face the main bedroom upstairs, Dee and his friend gasped and knew there was no intruder, at least no human one. In the window, clear as day, there stood a big black oily looking thing. Completely cementing the idea that this was not their minds playing tricks on them, the shape started moving, first towards a dresser, and then it began to move away from the window towards the door before disappearing from view. A moment later, Dee noticed one of the things he'd brought onto the porch but hadn't yet moved inside, a mirror. In the reflection of the mirror, movement caught his eyes, and he watched in horror as what looked like a dark, pulsating orb floated down the stairs. The reflection of this thing grew bigger and bigger. Get away from there! Get away from there! His friend was shouting nearby, but his voice sounded far away. Dee heard him, but he felt like he was in a trance. He was rooted to the spot, couldn't take his eyes off the mirror. Soon the reflection of the black ball took up the entire mirror. Then it emerged from the mirror and rapidly shot across the porch and began to enter Dee's body. Fingers of ice sank into his shoulders. His vision went cloudy. What was happening? Come on, man! His friend was yelling into his ear now and pulling on his arm. This snapped him out of whatever he was experiencing. The dark orb hadn't fully entered him, and both young men managed to run and make it to Dee's Chevy, parked along the curb. Dee quickly broke his lease following this incident, moved the stuff he'd moved in, still mostly in boxes, back out, and left the Chop Chop house forever. Lucky for Dee to have been able to do that. Some of the characters in this next story wouldn't be able to move out so quickly. Albie didn't know about the history of the Chop Chop, Chop, Chop House when he moved in as a college sophomore in 2007. He had no idea what had occurred there 20 years earlier. To him, it was just a good deal. A place he could afford with his part-time job and a little help from his parents and an exciting opportunity to live with some friends. Within a few months of moving in, when weird things began to happen at the house, Albie had assumed that some strange occurrences were just part of living with roommates. Sometimes milk got put in a cupboard instead of in the fridge, or toilet paper got unraveled and no one bothered to toss it out, or the sugar bowl was mysteriously empty just days after he filled it. Stuff like that. Annoying, but not scary. He'd always make a note to ask his roommates about it. After all, he was pitching in to buy things with his money, and he didn't want uh, those things misused. But then he'd get distracted, studying for an exam or working on some school assignment or something funny planned to do with his friends over the weekend, and he'd forget to ask them about it. And then he wouldn't think about it again until the next time he was making his morning coffee and realized he was out of sugar or whatever. This whole process would repeat when something would be off again, like no sugar in the bowl. His frustration with his roommates finally boiled over into action when Albie had to repair the transmission in his car. A big chunk of change for someone whose savings amounted to a couple hundred dollars. And he was suddenly forced to scrounge around his house for leftovers instead of going out. He was pilfering through couch cushions for change so he could do laundry. When he snapped and chewed them out for wasting shit he'd bought, they stared at him like he was crazy. Unable to get them to admit anything, he stopped arguing and stormed off to his room to sulk. By mid-November, Albie was really starting to regret living in the Chop Chop house. He was get, beginning to long for his old meal plan and dorm life, for janitors to clean the bathrooms and take out the trash. His roommates were now doing more than just wasting some of his food. They were messing with his sleep. One night, he woke up around four in the morning, freezing cold. Woke up to hearing a dragging sound coming from below him, from the basement. What the hell were his roommates even doing down there? Shh, shh, shh. Sounded like someone lugging around a sack of potatoes or something. And then very faintly, he heard someone whisper, It's your turn. Do it. Chop, 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 chop. What were they doing down there? Alvy wondered. He assumed they were probably drunk. Ugh. He was able to fall back asleep. 
He woke up the following morning covered in sweat, also woke up feeling shook. He'd been dreaming. He couldn't remember what his dreams had been about exactly, just that something had been chasing him. Something that almost caught him. He was more annoyed with his roommates than ever now. If they hadn't woken him up, he'd feel fine. Man, adult life was fucking stressful. About a week later, it was Friday night when Albie realized that he had no clean underwear for the next day. With a sigh, he resigned himself to the fact that he'd have to go to the laundromat instead of run off to hang out with some of his friends. Even though no one used it, they had a washing machine in the basement. Maybe. He thought he remembered hearing that. He'd actually never ventured down there. Never had a reason. The house wasn't in the best condition. He figured there was a decent chance it was broken. He knew from his friends that a lot of the student houses were like that. Landlords could get away with not fixing stuff, so they didn't. But maybe it worked, so he decided to go explore the basement. It was worth a shot. He sighed and went to his desk, where he kept a mug of quarters. It was fine. He wasn't too pissed. At least there was no big parties tonight, just a couple people hanging out around a friend's fire pit. Maybe they'd still be there when he was done cleaning his clothes. The sooner he cleaned his shit, the sooner he could shrug off a frustrating week and relax with a couple of beers. Except his quarters were not on his desk. God damn it. Who took them? Albie looked around his room, the slope ceiling with the posters and his unmade bed. His room was messy, but not that messy. He didn't think he'd misplace his quarters somewhere. He swore they'd been on his desk. No, he knew they'd been there. When he went out to get a snack the night before, he remembered taking two fifty and change and thinking he'd still have enough money to last through the week. He wanted to bang his head against the wall. His fucking roommates. The toilet paper and the sugar and whatever was frustrating, but his quarters, really? Now they were just straight up stealing from him. Hey man, where's my shit? There were probably better ways of phrasing that, but that wasn't where Albie's head was at when he descended down the stairs to the living room, where his roommates, James and Kai, were sitting on the couch watching a basketball game on TV. Both looked up confused as Albie walked in. Where'd your what? Kai asked, confused. Wait, are you, are you even talking to me? Albie waved his hand dismissively. I'm talking to whoever keeps taking my shit, specifically right now my quarters. I haven't seen them, James said, shaking his head. Kai also shook his head and Albie felt himself grow more irritated. Oh, okay. He said, so if neither of you took my quarters, who did? As far as I know, we're the only three people who live here, so... Hey, watch it, man. James snapped. He was a broad, buff dude, built like a linebacker. It was normally the most cool-headed person Albie knew, but when he got angry, he looked terrifying. He'd also been in a bad mood more often than usual lately, ever since a few weeks before when his dog had run away and never showed back up, no matter how many posters he'd put around the neighborhood. We told you we didn't take your shit, but someone did, Albie shot back. James and Kai shared a look and Albie felt himself become more angry. The two of them had been friends for a lot longer than he'd known them. Even though they were all pretty close, James and Kai were undoubtedly the closest. He always felt like the odd man out. No, worse, he felt like they were conspiring against him. I think you should calm down, Kai said. Albie took a step forward. I'll calm down when I get my shit back. I told you we don't have it. Are you calling us liars? You saying we stole your stupid fucking quarters, James said, now standing up from the couch? Fuck you, Albie said. He just slipped out. And as he stood there, shocked, he'd been so vicious. Bang! What the fuck was that, Kai, Kai said, all of the previous venom in his voice immediately turning into anxiousness. They looked around. Where would the noise come from? Everything in the house looked normal. So it must have been bang, bang! Outside, James said gruffly. I bet it's those Alpha Tau Omega fuckers. Maybe they've been coming here and playing pranks. Albie nodded, relieved not to be arguing with them anymore. He didn't know why he'd been so harsh. He didn't know they'd taken his change, not for sure. It felt like something had come over him, a powerful flood of anger that he'd been helpless to stop. But at the same time, he didn't think James was right. Why would a bunch of frat kids come in and mess around with their stuff almost imperceptibly, without leaving any kind of note or indication they'd been pranked? And the banging didn't sound like the playful actions of college students. To Albie, it sounded frantic. Less like someone trying to scare or mess with anyone, and more like it came from someone who was scared themselves. Before he could say any of this to his roommates, James said, Let's get out there. They'll just keep messing with us if we don't. Okay, Albie agreed, even though his stomach turned uh, at the thought. Kai nodded with an expression that indicated he felt the same as Albie, but both of them followed James to the back door anyway. As they stood in the doorway to the kitchen, the back door about 15 feet in front of them, James motioned for them all to be quiet. They stood staring at the door, each one wondering what would happen when they went outside. Bang! 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 It was the storm door, banging against the back door over and over and over. Albie couldn't see who was doing it. It was so dark outside. But every time it seemed like it was going to stop, it just continued, the hinges groaning. It was being slammed hard, so hard that a crack now appeared and spread from the corner to the center of the glass. Bang, 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 bang. Fuckers, James said. You're going to buy us a new fucking door. Before Albie could add anything, James charged forward and the back door immediately stopped banging as though no one was there. They didn't hear anyone running away. Albie would later wonder why he didn't hear footsteps or voices leading away from the backyard if it was truly frat boys messing with them. 
why it was just, why, why it all just went so silent so abruptly. In the moment, he could only watch with dismay as James left the house and vanished into the night, pushing past the broken storm door. Albie glanced over at Kai, who had the same worried expression. Should we? Kai started, and then a shout from the backyard startled them both. Holy shit! Both of them raced outside. James was standing in a small alleyway beside the house. At first, Albie expected someone else to be standing there near him, or standing in the front yard. But as his eyes adjusted, he realized that James wasn't looking at anyone else. He was looking at the side of their house, and his eyes were wide with terror. Dude, I, I think that's blood. Spread across the side of the house was a series of handprints, smudged but distinct, in a darkened, definitely blood-like color that Albie prayed wasn't what it looked like. As his eyes followed the progression of the handprints to the street, he realized they got weaker and weaker, and lower and lower, starting off at around shoulder height and dropping to around knee height, as though the person leaving them had dropped onto their knees and ended up crawling, trying to use the house for support, but continually slipping off as they began to run low on blood. What the fuck? Albie whispered, at the same time as Kai said, that's not Alpha Tau Omega. We should call the police, Albie said, his heart pounding. We don't even know that that's real, Kai said, shaking his head. I mean, yeah, it doesn't seem like a frat thing, but maybe. James put his hand to the wall. When he brought his hand back, Albie saw that it was covered in a red, slick substance with the consistency that only blood had. It's real, Albie said. And then James collapsed and fell to the ground. James, James! Kai shouted, running over to his friend. James' eyes rolled back into his head, his body convulsing, like he was having some kind of seizure. And then he stopped, completely. He didn't move at all, like he wasn't breathing or anything. For a long moment, everything was still. James! Albie shouted nervously, wondering how long it would take him to get inside, how long it would take him to call the police or an ambulance, what the fuck he would say to them. As he knelt to the ground, Kai spoke first. Should we... BAM! Like a shot, James clambered to his feet, took off into the night now, running faster than Albie had ever seen any human being run. What the fuck? Kai chanted, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? Call the fucking police, Albie shouted, taking off after James, though he could only see a small blurry shape in the distance now. As he ran, his lungs burned, and there was a thought that occurred to him like it wasn't beamed in, like it was beamed into his head, like he hadn't thought it, but it was chanting inside him, thrumming like a heartbeat. Gotta get him, 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 gotta get him. Eventually, it was so loud that it sounded like screaming. Just then, Albie realized this. This is what he'd been dreaming about the night when he woke up in a sweaty mess. Except in his dream, he was the one running away, not the one chasing. Now he began to wonder, how often had he not felt like himself in the past few months? Had his roommates really been taking his stuff, or wasting it, or had he done that to himself? Memories began flooding back of him dumping out the sugar, of him hiding his own quarters, memories of him doing things, but it felt like when he did them, he was someone else. What the hell? Albie would run and run that night, and the further away from the house he got, the more he felt like himself, like the person he'd always known. Not the person he'd been changing into since he'd moved into this new house. Finally, he gave up looking for James and returned, and when he got back, he was alarmed to see Kai on the porch, a blanket wrapped around his shoulders, an eerily blank expression on his face. I heard sounds from the basement, he whispered, dragging, chop, chop, chop. I went down there, and his teeth were chattering heavily. I saw it. All the blood. So much blood. James would be found the next morning walking around the Brownlee Reservoir, saying he had to put himself back together. Albie was from Boise and moved back to his parents' house after all this, happy to delay adulthood just a bit longer, if it meant staying sane. James and Kai actually finished out their lease in the house, but did their best to stay out of the home as much as possible. They couch surfed, they both conveniently, quickly got girlfriends, ended up basically living at those girls' houses. Albie lost touch with them, and he heard they stopped hanging out with each other as well by the time the lease was up. He guessed they all wanted to forget what they'd experienced. Despite these and many other chilling anecdotes, the current owner, James Howell, insists the home is not haunted. Would you believe him and move in if the money was right? Hell no. He sounds like an opportunist and I don't like him. Or maybe just not a believer. I mean, still, like that was my very first note of like, okay, this guy, if he, uh, if he knows the cough box isn't there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know I did the same thing. <clears throat> Excuse <laughs> <It> me. Vanished. <clears throat> I think when the new set went in, uh, it probably got knocked down. Um, yeah, my very first note was, uh, is, is if this guy knows that this house is supposedly haunted or if he's from the area, like, did he buy it and then just think, like, whatever, I'll just rent it out cheap yeah, to students? Yeah. Or is he, you know, somebody who's an investor who doesn't live around there, who has a property manager, and he just doesn't give a shit, yeah. right? And it's just like, well, it's a good, it's a good investment. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. You want to see a few pictures? 
I mean, yes, I most certainly do. I, I don't have anything exceptional. This first one, just a, 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 the most recent Google Street image view of the Boise Murder House, aka the Boise Chopped Up House at 805 West Linden Street. And you can disregard, we can't even see it from where we, but there's a little oh, 804 yeah. South Nashua Lane in the photo, but that's, I don't know why Google did that. It is the correct house. Maybe that's a cross street or something. Yeah. And then this next one's a better photo of the home, date unlisted. And then I can't find any photos from inside the house. But it's okay. just a normal craftsman. And actually, like a really cool. The bones are great. Yeah. But. Yeah. But a bad history. But bad bones in the basement. Yep. Literally. Could, uh, yeah. You get it. <laughs> I do. I, uh, and then this is from 1987 in Idaho. Uh, well, not in Idaho, but an Idaho kid. From This is just me. I couldn't find any uh, oh, look at you. pictures of the people Look at that from back mullet, then. So that there, little rat tail situation going on. Yeah, so there's an Idaho kid from 1987 with a mullet. And mullets are back. So here's yeah. the thing. You were a trendsetter. <laughs> totally did, you, did you even know? Didn't even Who know. was next to you in that photo? That was my stepmom, Colleen. Oh, I was like, that's a person in your life I have never met nor seen. Yeah. Oh. Well, Colleen. Yeah. Mm. Uh, she did some damage. <laughs> and that's, and that's all, it. Yeah, did you get any questions for that story? I mean, I don't really know that I have questions. I definitely have thoughts like that the back half of that story with Albie and Kai and James... Yeah. It's such an odd thing where we, it feels like they all became possessed by what happened there. Like like a recreation. Right, right, exactly. That's what I was thinking, like the chasing, you know, because they chased that guy that night he was killed. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, like the, the ghosts of the various three people involved yeah. somehow got, I don't know, muddied up in there. Who knows? Yeah, almost like they're all sort of like stuck somehow. And mm -hmm. then it, I don't know, embodied them. It. I don't know. I can't think of a situation where it's like, yes, like sometimes there will be one person yeah. who is experiencing stuff and then has to explain it to the rest. But for all three of them to be pulled into it and then recreate it, essentially, uh -huh, exactly. that's very peculiar. Yeah, they all got caught up in that loop that the the, the stuff with people were stuck in. Yeah, yeah, that tragic, yeah. Tragic, tragic loop. Mm -hmm. I know. Lucky for Albie, he got to move back in with his folks. Those other <laughs> yeah. two guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. I felt really bad for them. Um, I'm trying to see if I had any other notes. Uh, so, something about the basement I can't remember. Oh, well. I think that's it. Okay. I think that's it. I'm going to ask your sister. She lives oh, yeah, in the Boise yeah. area. I'm like, do you know where this is? Have you heard of this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I wonder how much popular, how popular that story is in uh, local folklore. It shows up, um, when I was looking looking, you know, into it, there was definitely some articles from like radio stations, local radio stations. Oh, really? When they do their, you know, uh, Halloween kind of uh, focused stories in October. Oh, it yeah. showed up in some lists of like the most haunted places in Boise. That makes sense. And I have I have a question unrelated. Yeah. I thought it was the Visalia House. Am I saying it wrong? Well, I looked it up this morning, uh, and it was. And I remember when you told that story, one of us constantly got it right, and one of us constantly got it wrong. <laughs> so I'm just curious. Yeah, it's um. Oh my gosh, where yeah, the uh, Velisca. V I L L I S C A, the Velisca uh, Murder House, the Velisca Axe House. Why did I decide it was decide it was Velisca? <laughs> well, you know, what? it didn't That's look a, right that, to me either. That sounds like a Lindsay thing. And then, and so now I'm gonna um, actually just pull it up as we're talking about it. Because here's what I think I will did, happen. But if I we... looked at two. I went to two different um, <laughs> videos to find it. With you know, one was like BuzzFeed did how, a thing about it. How dare you not spend hours making sure it's correct? Oh uh, yeah, no. I, and then the other one, there's this guy. Um, oh my god, now I'm blanking on his name. He's um younger British guy, thin build, bald guy. He does an insane amount of videos. Okay. It's all on YouTube. There are these random Simon something, Simon. Simon Cowell. No, not Simon Cowell. But, uh, no? all right. Yeah, it is Velisca. But, um, yeah, the, the Velisca Axe Murders. All right. Well, look, I just wanted to address it in case it was wrong, that we don't have to deal with a flood of emails about how you got it wrong, <laughs> which I like, I don't care, but yeah. I, we can just address it right here, right now. Oh, I wish I Velisca. could. Velisca. I wish I could. Oh, find this guy's but there's this one guy he has ah this british simon whistler that's ah, gonna drive me crazy oh no simon simon si who are you simon something simon says <laughs> simon says my last name is to get you know what i think it is it is simon whistler uh, he's a youtuber and he has boob -tuber. a gift for pronunciation. Like, it is crazy like he, he doesn't do the research i don't think himself for any of his stuff he has like uh -huh. there's a team of writers it's, um, you know, like he gets these scripts because he references it when he's doing his videos, but he's part of like several series, true crime, history, 
and he, and he gives these really great synopsis of, uh, of various topics and he actually cool. covered that, but he, I mean, I, I do find that a lot of British people compared to Americans have a more proper speaking kind of tech. Imagine, imagine that. Yeah. They speak more properly, but he is, I will say is, is exceptional. A gifted linguist. Very gifted. I think. Yeah. He probably has a large mouth. He might. Like, I don't even mean like a big smile. I just mean yeah. space in his mouth. True, a little his, more. His tongue is probably very flexible. Like He's not tongue-tied, small mouth like me. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You get it. No, but seriously. <laughs> seriously, that, that, that changes things, yeah. All of it. And then, yeah, just proper yeah. language. But I trust him. If he if he messes it up, then if, I'm like, If Simon's oh, got it wrong, everyone, well. Everyone's messing it up. Okay, fair enough. You want to move on? I do. Okay, let's get head out to some Colorado-based scares now. Okay. I love Colorado. All right, a little bit of tragic real-world setup again. Oh, fun. And then off into the supernatural. I'll just be over here with my cough drops. The third bridge is located near the town of Bennett, Colorado. Little over 3,000 people live in just past the outer eastern suburbs of Denver. Locals call it the Ghost Bridge, and it has long been a popular spot for thrill-seeking thrill -seeking teens to hang out. How it came to be known as the third bridge wasn't made clear in any of the sources we could find. The haunting supposedly began with the death of a Native American warrior killed in battle during the area's frontier days. His spirit is said to roam the bridge with his horse. When darkness falls, some, some hear the sound of war drums. Other spirits often report, uh, often report, have often been reported, there we go, to walk the bridge are the spirits of teenagers killed in car accidents. Car accidents being a common occurrence on the bridge at night over the years. During the summer of 1997, a car full of teenagers lost control and fell into the creek below the bridge. Two girls died that night. Numerous ghost hunters have claimed to witness their spirits on or near the bridge ever since. In October of 2016, a car flipped over multiple times on the bridge and then actually burst into flames, killing all five teenagers trapped inside. Following that tragedy, there have also been reports of their spirits being spotted around the bridge. A few people have reported being chased by a large, dark shadow as well, an entity much bigger than a human, described as being about the size of a grizzly bear. All kinds of people have reported experiencing strange and spooky phenomena along the bridge. The following is an account of a terrifying experience on Third Bridge from an online discussion board. Time now for the tale of Shadows of the Third Bridge. When I was younger, my friends and I went through a phase where we were addicted to traveling to haunted locations in our home state of Colorado. One place in particular, Third Bridge, stood out from all the others and left me with memories I'll never forget. We were researching haunted areas in Colorado that we could go to that weren't too far of a drive. Right away, we came across a page about the Third Bridge. We read about the history of the area, several deadly skirmishes between tribes and settlers, numerous car accidents that killed several teenagers, and so many reported sightings. We decided it would be worth the trip to check things out, so four of us climbed into my Toyota 4Runner, and off we went. To get to the bridge, once we left the interstate, we took the county line road to the middle of nowhere. There was almost nothing in the area. Farmhouses were spread out a great distance from each other, and there were no street lights. It's pitch black out there if you turn your headlights off, which we did for a few moments here and there. Nice and spooky. Eventually the road turned into dirt, and we took that road until we got to the top of a small hill. From there, our headlights illuminated a scene straight out of a horror movie. Down below, you could see the small concrete bridge that withstood the test of time but was in rough shape. The creek that used to run directly under it was completely dried out. The bridge is partially surrounded by those big trees that cast oddly shaped shadows in the light. Doesn't make any sense in writing, but they looked evil as if they had faces and they were all staring at you with devilish grins. Just being on that hill, looking down at that scene, overwhelmed me with dread. We hadn't been sitting there more than two minutes when I saw, at the foot of the bridge, a dark shadow just standing there, a figure. I knew it was staring at us. I could feel it. It had no facial features that I could see. It just looked like a solid black figure in the outline of a person. I looked at my friend in the passenger seat and asked him if he was seeing this right now, and all he said was, yep, with a terrified look on his face. I looked in the back to see my other two friends also staring at this thing, eyes wide in terror. As I returned my focus back to the thing, it started sprinting, running straight at us. Once it started running, something dark fanned out from behind it as if it was wearing a, a long flowing cape or something. I put my SUV in reverse and got the hell out of there. We didn't even make it to the bridge that night. I'm still not sure what exactly we saw. After we all told some of our other friends about what happened, some of them really wanted to go back and check it out. They were curious. They wanted to see this shadow thing with their own eyes. And for some reason, I agreed to take them. The couple I had gone with the first time didn't want to go again. I couldn't blame them. My other friend, though, who sat shotgun that night, we all saw it, surprisingly was down to return. So I loaded up my vehicle again with another full crew, and we headed back out to Third Bridge. 
For a second time, I drove down the long dirt road to the top of the hill, parking and waiting for something to happen. Rather than dread this time, I felt a surge of nervous excitement. We waited a few minutes. The shadow man wasn't there again, so we decided to make our descent down to the bridge. I parked my vehicle right in the middle of it, turned off the engine, rolled the windows down, and with all of our lights off, we just sat in total darkness and quiet. Even though we could barely see anything around us, I felt like something could see me, like I was being watched. My eyes eventually adjusted to the dark. Although I couldn't see anything around us but trees and open land, a feeling of impending terror sat in my stomach. I knew something was about to happen. My friends didn't share this feeling, and we were growing antsy and bored. I decided to fire up the engine again. We slowly crept the car towards the end of the bridge, leaving the headlights off and the radio off as well. I parked again and turned the engine back off. We sat there for probably another 10 minutes and still, nothing happened. But that feeling of dread returned. Or remained, excuse me, bored and frustrated we still hadn't experienced anything. One of my friends in the back seat suggested we go under the bridge now. If you asked me today, I'd say no right away, but back then I was eager to prove we hadn't made up what we saw the first time. And despite my feelings of apprehension, I did want to see something again. We all got out of the car and made our way to the railing to step over and get to the ground under the bridge. We hadn't walked more than a few yards when we heard a blood-curdling scream. It sounded like some woman, and she screamed like she was in pain. Upon hearing her fear took over my body and I started to tear up. We all booked it back to my car to get the hell out of there. When I started the car and turned on my headlights, BAM! There she was, standing right in front of us, a teen girl covered in blood, her body mangled and mutilated. Staring straight forward directly at us, she screamed again and we all screamed back as I threw the car into reverse, sped back across the bridge, whipped it around and then drove away as fast as I could. Unsurprisingly, I haven't been back since. More friends heard about what we'd seen that night and a few wanted me to head out there again. No fucking way. I've seen enough to feel satisfied that the stories are true. I've seen more than enough. I wish I could forget the image of that poor girl. Also, what is her connection, if any, to the shadow figure we saw the first time? A mystery I'm content to never investigate. I don't blame them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Brave to go back. Yeah. But I, mean, I also understand that that burning desire to like prove. Like it happened, it happened, it's real. I didn't just see it. Other people yeah. saw it. Come see, come look. I mean, I feel that way just in life in general. I yep. don't I don't like to be questioned in that way. Like it makes me feel anxious and uneasy yeah. if someone's like, eh, I don't know if I believe you. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll show I'll you. I'll show you. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Yep, I get that too. Yeah. Do you have any photos that go along with this? Yeah, I have a picture of the third bridge here, this rural bridge. It's a very like low bridge. So you can oh. just kind of like see the little railing there. Yeah, that's not what I was expecting at all. No, you wouldn't even know that it was a bridge if you were driving at night and there was no sign. No, it's like a almost like a freeway overpass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just over literally like uh, used to be a little creek bed there. And then this next picture is underneath the bridge. So you can see there's like a, a little bit of room there where creepy stuff could be hanging out. Okay, but also like just a spot where like kids go and yep. smoke a joint, yep, hang totally. out, whatever. Yeah, I mean, there was a hundred places like this growing up. Yeah, yeah, there's a bunch of graffiti there. And then finally, just a little palate cleanser. This is a picture of just some old women playing bridge that I just grabbed from the internet. <laughs> okay, I have a very funny bridge story. <laughs> yeah? Okay, oh, probably only funny to people here in Coeur d'Alene, but I was telling- Oh, I think I know that, yeah. Uh, our friend Allison about this. It's just, it's so comical to me. Okay, so here in Kootenai County, where we live, about a mile-ish from the studio, yeah. there is this building, and it says Kootenai Bridge Academy. For years. I'm talking, we have lived here for seven, eight years now, whatever it is, yeah. six, seven years. I have always assumed that at, that is a place where old ladies go to play bridge. Like, I thought it was like a community bridge center. <laughs> yeah. Tyler starts working here and somehow it comes, that place comes up and he tells me that it is uh, like an alternative school for kids. Yeah. My mind is completely blown. I was just telling Allison this. She was laughing until she was crying. She's like, how, how could you possibly think I that, that it was a, giant building yeah. was like where old ladies were going to play bridge? I'm like, because that's what I thought. And I would tell like, I would say to like Dan's grandma, like, listen, if you ever come, like want to stay for a long time, there's the bridge academy. You can go hang out there. Like, <laughs> yeah, because she plays bridge. Yeah, exactly. Was, oh my God. I thought it was so that too. Stupid. I thought it was that, yeah, big oh, like tournament God. type place. So funny. I didn't even think tournaments. I just thought like, but that would, that, that is so dumb. That That's like saying like, oh, and there's the Uno Center. There's <laughs> the Rummy Center. Like, yeah. What was I thinking? The old maid center. Oh my gosh. Go fish. Great. What movie did you and I just watch that was kind of scary that I picked, I picked Friday night to watch? Oh my uh, gosh. You, you keep talking and I'll look it up. Uh, I know, I know what, I know what keywords to put in, but I can't remember the name of the movie. I see you or something. Um, so Friday night, 
Dan and I, okay, I love a psychological thriller. It, it, I see you. I see you. Yep, yep. From 2019. Uh, Helen Hunt. Helen Hunt. Oh, yeah. Because that started a whole other deep dive, like what happened to Helen Hunt's face. I know. She I'm convinced very, that she had different. a stroke. I'm convinced she had a stroke because her speech pattern is off. That said, yeah. that movie was terrifying. Yeah. It, it really got me. So if you guys are, this is like just unsolicited recommendation. But if you're looking for yeah. a good scary movie with The Bridge, it made me think about that movie. Just like piece it all together in my brain. How did that The Bridge make you think of the Helen Hunt movie? I can tell you why. Because thinking about bridges like that, there's tons of like little underpasses like that that exist where I grew up. Yeah. And then when we were watching that movie, they said something, something Brexville. And I was like, oh, this movie is clearly oh, shot in Ohio. Because the movie has nothing to do with bridges. I, but in my mind, Got it. connection. Gotcha. Okay. You get it. You get it. How are you feeling over there? I'm okay. You, you seem like you're doing pretty well. You did a really good job telling those stories under these circumstances. Thanks. My brain is very foggy. No, you did great. But I, I feel okay. You're great. Do you need a throat thing? No, I'm good. Okay, great. I had about six. <laughs> and I've been sipping, oh, the grossest thing ever, turkey tail. I don't know. For all my herbalist friends out there, man, turkey tail is gross. It's like a kind of mushroom that you sip on when you don't feel well. Are you ready to just relax and listen? I am. That would probably be good for your brain, huh? Yep. Yeah. So the hat man. You haven't had a hat man story in a while. I haven't. Yeah. Right? Nope. Uh, and this story goes against everything I like about scary stories because it doesn't really wrap up at the end. And we all know I despise a story without a proper ending. Yeah. So I'm pretty proud of myself for going outside my comfort zone on this one. Okay, good. All right. So we just have one big juicy tale. It spans a long period of time. And it's one of those stories that we like to throw in every so often where it's spooky and it gets under your skin, but maybe in the moment it doesn't cause those big scary moments so much as when you're going to bed tonight and you're lying there and it's in your subconscious, and you're like, that was really creepy. So I'm excited to share this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you're funny. Hi there, my two favorite podcast hosts. My name is Angela and I live in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Long drives have been the perfect opportunity to binge almost ep every episode of Scared to Death. My daughter has taken to reminding me when it's new episode day, as we've coined it, and she begs me to put on an episode anytime we're in the car and go anywhere. I love this. I love kids getting into the spoops. Yeah. All right, let's dive in. Mid, late 80s. My dad was in his mid-20s, hadn't met my mom yet, and was dating Linda. In his thickest youper accent, which by the way, that is like a term coin to people from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I had to look that up. He told me the following story. He'd been seeing Linda for a short amount of time, but long enough that he felt comfortable walking into her house unannounced to visit. One afternoon, he stopped by after work to find that Linda was in the shower. They had no plans to do anything, and Linda didn't know he was coming over, so the house was a bit untidy. Books about blankets, clothes in the living room unfolded, and last night's dinner still on the stove. My dad decided to poke around while he waited for the sound of the shower to stop so he could announce his presence. On the coffee table, under some papers and miscellaneous bits and bobs, was a black bound book that he'd never seen in her home before. He pulled it out from underneath the stack and flipped it open. Very old, yellowed pages inside. And inside the book, in his words, was some witchy shit or something. My dad was raised very Christian, so this simply did not sit well with him, and he planned to ask what the book was. The shower stopped, and my dad hollered for her and was met with something along the lines of, just a second. Out she came, and my dad was still standing in the living room, book in hand. He said she noticed the book in his hands and immediately began screaming and berating my father, instructing him to drop the book and leave the house immediately and that he was no longer welcome in her home. Confused and a little bit angry, he started yelling back. Names and insults were being thrown left and right until finally he opted to end the relationship right then and there. At this moment, Linda raised one hand, pointer finger extended, and her face went cold. Not angry cold, but like she just wasn't even there. She was just gone. Her steely eyes boring into him until they slowly closed, head tilted back while she still pointed at him. And that's how she stayed, like a statue. He tossed the book aside, slammed the door behind him, and never looked back. Linda died a few years later of a suspected overdose, but it was never confirmed. 
Fast forward a few years to 1992. My parents have officially met and begun dating, and then to 1993, they're married. My mother was diagnosed infertile several years earlier due to a trauma she had endured, but my dad never gave up hope. In early 1994, he said he laid his head upon my mother's stomach and begged and prayed for a child. Given the way things have gone for me, I'm not so sure it was any God that answered his prayers. Late 94, here I am, a healthy baby girl who, for all intents and purposes, was their little miracle. We lived in a small two-bedroom trailer during the beginning of my life on a piece of property of a piece of the piece of property my dad was building a house for us. They swear up and down that I was an angel of a baby, and that if all their kids had been like me, they would have had 20. What they couldn't explain was, before I was able to move around on my own, they would find me lying on the floor, across the room from my crib, in front of my bedroom door, screaming and crying, still wrapped in my blanket. Once I was able to toddle around the house on my own, I would randomly go through bouts of hiding. Not the innocent, playful hiding that young children do, but the kind of hiding you do when you're afraid and you don't want to be found. They would find me under tables, in closets, under beds, always trembling and teary-eyed. My parents assumed it was just some kind of quirk, and they waited for it to eventually pass. Come the early 2000s, my mother's parents had both passed away, and we moved from the house that my father had built while I was a baby into an upper and lower duplex. It was set up as two apartments, one above the other, but we owned the entire home. My parents used the living room of the upper apartment as their bedroom. My brother, who was born two years after me, had a bedroom across from them, and my bedroom was at the end of the hall. From my young childhood to now, the fits seemed to have passed. No more crying and screaming, no more hiding, nothing. My brother never experienced any of this, so my parents thought maybe it was a product of them being first-time parents with me. Nothing about this new house was scary. It was dated, even for the early 2000s, but we did make it feel like home. My dad renovated the basement, painting the concrete floors to have marble rings and a hopscotch. They added a couch and our Nintendo, and even building me a dollhouse large enough that my brother and I could use the floors as bunk beds. The scariest part to the kids, and it was the room at the very back of the basement that housed the water heater and other various house appliances. It was a square and made out of cinder blocks and didn't have a door, probably about the size of your average half bath. We would play down in the basement regularly, and from my memory, it was never a bad place for to be for kids our age. Until I saw him. One afternoon, after hours and hours of Mario, my mom yelled for us to come up for dinner. My brother bounced from the couch, and up the stairs he went. But I had a level to finish, and I wasn't about to eat until I had beaten it. Gamer brain starts at a young age. After I finished, I stood up from the couch and turned to my right. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow in the room that housed the water heater, unnaturally tall to the point where it looked as if its neck was bent in order to fit in the room. All black, but I was still able to make out a long coat and a hat. Frozen with fear, I stood still. I didn't turn my head, just my eyes, and I waited for it to just do something, anything. But it was deathly still the entire time like it was waiting for me to move. Knowing I had to go by this room in order to get up the stairs, my little brain thought the only logical explanation was to sprint and scream at the very top of my lungs for my mother. She caught me as I reached the top step and tried to calm me enough to understand what I was trying to say. After some big breaths and a lot of tears, I was finally able to tell her, The man, mom, there's a man downstairs. But she didn't budge and just continued to comfort me until I was calm enough to sit down and eat dinner. Eventually, my little pea brain forgot all about the incident and we continued to play Nintendo in the basement. My bedroom in this house had floor-to-ceiling closets across the entire back wall. The leftmost cabinet had shelving for sheets, blankets, and so on. But the rest of the closet was a sliding door and inside was plenty large enough for several people to stand inside of it. Not useful for a five to seven-year-old. My bed was opposite the closet on the same wall as my bedroom door, minimally decorated with a few toys. There was nothing between my bed and these closets. Given my experience in the basement, I'm sure most everybody knows where this is going. One night, the leftmost closet door opened. They were old wooden doors, so the sound they made was that light squeak sound of wood on wood. I heard the sound and my eyes immediately shot open. I didn't move my head or my body, but again tilted my eyes in the direction of the closet. I couldn't see anything at all. My room was very dim, 
and only the moon illuminated the corner near my window. As my eyes adjusted, shapes of things started to become a bit more clear. Folded blankets, a stuffed animal, nothing out of the ordinary. I got my imagination under control and managed to doze back off. Days passed. Another incident is forgotten, and I'm headed for dreamland in my bed. Having just been tucked in, I'm lying in bed looking up at my ceiling when I hear the sound again. It's not the sound of wood on wood, but of rollers, as in the small wheels that closet doors use to slide open and close. A little at a time, like a light huff sound as it opened, a little at a time. My eyes don't move from the ceiling at first, but eventually I can't contain it and they dart across to the closet door. All I can see is a man, too tall for the closet, ducking to fit through and now standing in my room, not moving, not making noise, yet again doing nothing. I can't see his eyes, but I can feel them, staring at me, waiting for me to scream or run or do something. I look back towards my ceiling and I heard the small thud of a shoe. And then again and again until I knew he was near my bed, near me. And then my mattress sank down. He or it was sitting at the side of my bed. I never looked, not once. I just laid there paralyzed with fear, too afraid to look, too afraid to close my eyes, just staring at the ceiling until I heard movement outside my bedroom door. Someone had gotten up to use the bathroom. And then I felt my mattress return to normal. The toilet flushed, the footsteps receded down the hallway, and finally I felt like I could look. My bedroom was empty. It was only me, but the closet door was wide open and pitch black inside. After that night, I never felt quite comfortable in my bedroom. I found excuses to sleep anywhere else in the house. It worked for quite a while until it didn't. I started to sleepwalk. I would sleep on the couch in my parents' room, the floor of my little brother's room, even the living room downstairs. But every morning when I woke up, I was somehow in my bedroom. In my bed, closet door wide open, but no signs of how I got there or who had taken me to bed. This went on for quite a while until I woke up at the bottom of the stairs. Everything hurt. Bruises covered my legs. Instead of going from where I was sleeping to my bed, I had gone to the top of the stairs. After my mom found me and realized what had happened, she looked me over, top to bottom, examining my bruises and making sure I wasn't concussed and nothing was broken. She thought my brother had shoved me down the stairs, but he was too young and didn't even know what that would mean. All these years later, I asked her about this house. She said she hated it because, quote, even in the middle of June, she was walking around trying to locate the freezing cold draft that seemed to come from my bedroom. A few years later, after my younger sister was born, we moved again, this time to a totally different town in a rundown farmhouse that my dad intended to fix up. We had 10 acres, big bedrooms, and a chicken coop. Exactly what my parents wanted. We'd try and scare our new friends by telling them that our house was 110 years old and haunted by Frank, the man who built the place. It worked on some, but usually ended up in all sleepovers happening at someone else's house instead of ours. I spent the rest of my childhood in this house and up until my early teen years without incident. I'd grown up enough that my mom let me choose the decor scheme for my bedroom, and I really thought I was the shit when I opted for pink screen lights around the ceiling. I had a twin bed, which I'd pushed alongside the slanted wall ceiling, and a decorative chair at the end of it. The chair wasn't so much for sitting as it was for collecting the clothes of a 13-year-old. You know, a 13-year-old had things piled up high with various clothes that, did, that I didn't want to put away. I'd gotten used to sleeping with the string lights on, and they never awoke me. This house was quiet once you became accustomed to the different sounds and squeaky floorboards. No noises outside as we were surrounded by woods and trees, far from any main roads. But on this particular night, I awoke with a jolt. Not enough to sit upright, but my eyes snapped open. I didn't know why. I couldn't pinpoint any particular reason. No cats in my room to nudge me, no coyotes howling outside, and it was clearly not daytime out there. Until I saw him again. The same man. All black, his features slightly more discernible in real lighting. Dark hat, dark face, dark coat that hung low. This time, he wasn't standing in a doorway or exiting a closet. He was sitting in that chair, the chair I had at the end of my bed. I looked at him long enough to know he was looking back at me, even though I again saw no eyes. I laid back, staring at my ceiling for ages again until daylight came and I could bring myself to fully breathe. At this age, I was old enough to know better. Bad dreams, sleep paralysis, stress from school or friends or boys, any number of things could have brought this on. It couldn't be real. 
After spending the day doing whatever it is teenagers do, I returned to my room to listen to music and hang out. I sat on my bed and noticed the chair for the first time since this incident. The pile, I mean the huge pile of clothes that had been stacked on it were no longer there. The chair was empty and the clothes had been moved to the other side of the room. It was that moment I could no longer rationalize what I had seen. It happened. He had definitely been there. I had learned to accept this man and that I would see him occasionally. Sometimes I left the chair cleaned off for him because I figured he was going to clean it off anyways. I gave him a nickname, though I never spoke it aloud, and I never mentioned him to my friends. Accepting him never lessened my fear of when I would see him. The paralyzing fear has come flooding back as I sit here now. The goosebumps never truly go away. He stopped appearing as frequently as I grew up. I moved into the house across the street from my parents, and there I lived for several years. I welcomed both of my children during this time, and life continued on. It was a small two-bedroom house, nothing grand, but it was home nonetheless. The living room was built many years prior to my moving in as an addition. It was a step down from the kitchen, so the threshold was prominent between the two rooms. My bedroom door was off the kitchen and swung inward. So walking into the kitchen, there was no avoiding seeing that threshold or the man that stood in it. It was a tall door frame to account for the step up. So he never had to bend his head to fit like he did in my closet all those years before. He never moved towards me like he had when I was a child or sat down like he had when I was a teen. I would get up to check on my daughter in the next room. I would walk out of my bedroom and there he stood almost as menacing as before. But this time, I had gotten so used to him that I hardly paid him any mind. If he had wanted to harm me, surely he would have done so already. My grandmother passed away in December of 2018, leaving her home to my father, who then passed away in January 2019, leaving the house to me. The same house my dad grew up in that my grandma lived in alone since her husband passed away in 2008. I moved in shortly after my dad passed because it was much closer to the funeral home, my attorney's office, and all the things the estate executor had to deal with when someone passes away. It was a cozy home. It felt like childhood. We'd spend weeks here in the summer with my grandparents, and there were no bad memories. It never felt like home, but it was fine. The cellar we were afraid of as kids was still just as scary as an adult. The floorboard still creaked in the same spots, and the air still smelled like my grandmother's perfume. All was well until, well, there's always an until in these types of stories, isn't there? Until I realized the house was riddled with shadow people, the kinds of people you see out of the corner of your eye in mirrors behind doors, never fully in view, but enough so for your brain to register it. They darted around the living room, between bedrooms, out of view when you would open the bathrooms. I had convinced myself I had truly lost it. The traumas and responsibilities of the year were finally catching up to me and my brain couldn't handle it. Walking into the living room in the early morning to see closet doors open, lights on, things missing, things moved. I couldn't explain it. And no one else seemed to notice it. So it couldn't be real, could it? And that brings us to the here and now. My boyfriend, myself, and my two kids from my previous marriage all live in a home that we purchased in the summer of 2020. A three-bed, one-bath, ranch-style home in a mid-sized town with good schools. No more living in the sticks. No more weird duplex situations. No more dead relatives' homes. We were so excited to be homeowners and move to a town away from everything we knew. I was excited for a fresh start after losing so many loved ones. Moving into our home was bliss for the first few months. We celebrated our first Thanksgiving and invited our whole family. Our first Halloween trick-or-treating in a new town. It seemed like the perfect suburban happy ending. My boyfriend had always been a healthy man. He works construction outside in the elements. My kids, both happy, healthy children, and I have never had any major illnesses or injuries. But then my boyfriend suddenly fell ill and not a normal end of the year cold, but the kind that sent him to the emergency room at the local hospital, who then referred him to a cardiac specialist. An unspecified heart condition, they said. His doctors couldn't pinpoint the cause or even what it was. Next, my daughter. She's struck by stomach pains, the kind that buckle you at your knees. Doctors can't quite pinpoint that either. They blame lactose intolerance Mm. or something of the like, but still, no clear answers. And then me, someone who had successfully carried and delivered two healthy children easily without complication. I suddenly lost a baby with no explanation. Wave after wave of illness rocked our home for months and months on end. Nothing we did could cure it, clean it, change it. We were always sick, always in pain, always miserable. 
Parents all know how often school-aged kids bring home the sniffles or stomach bug, but this was way beyond anything something DayQuil could cure. We couldn't pick ourselves up. We were constantly drained. I decided to take a nap one afternoon during a winter month. A Midwestern winter means 6 p.m. darkness. The TV on the wall displayed a digital clock that the only, and that was the only light in the room when I awoke. I laid there for a moment looking at the wall, knowing it was about time to get up and start dinner. I could hear sounds coming from the living room, cartoons and kids playing. Talking myself out of a sleepy state and about ready to get up, I felt my side of the mattress sink down. Having three people in the home, I assumed someone had snuck in to wake me up because I had slept until dinner time. I laid there and waited to get jumped on by one of my children or to hear, babe, time to get up from my boyfriend. But nothing came. I picked up my head to look at the end of my bed, expecting to see someone from my family. But it was just him. Again. I laid my head back down on my pillow slowly and held my breath. I don't know how much time passed, but eventually I felt the corner of the mattress by my feet lift and regain its shape again. Still terrified and unwilling to look at this thing, I pulled the blanket up over my eyes until I felt like I was alone again. When I looked down at the foot of my bed, my room was empty. I walked out into the living room to find my kids watching TV, excited to see me, and my boyfriend playing video games completely unbothered and unaware that I had woken up. I haven't told him a thing about this incident because he mentions all the time that our house is cursed, and I simply do not want to fuel the fire. I know it was lengthy, and I apologize for that. It's the first time telling the story in its entirety, but the more things that happened to me, the more I can't help but wonder if all those years ago, Linda had a hand in cursing my dad's firstborn child. Thanks for reading. I hope it ticks all the boxes and fuels your fears of shadow people in the hat man. Keep doing what you're doing. You guys are wonderful. Angela. Thanks, Angela. That was a great story. Great. A lifetime of being haunted by this thing right i can't imagine yeah the one the one detail i thought was um you know like if it was me yeah that would have switched it from like well maybe i'm just like sleep paralysis or sleepwalking or like all these other possible explanations yeah was i think it was the second home they were in when it was the chair the 13 yeah. year old the clothes on the chair and she said like uh you know the chair the, the clothes would then be removed after this thing was there yeah i mean it, 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 i mean if I was certain that I had let that, that pile was there when I went to bed, totally. Then saw that thing in the middle of the night. Then the next morning, the clothes are gone. That would kind of cement it when combined with all the other sightings. Yeah, yeah. I feel so bad for her because it feels like she sounds like a steady person. Like she's realistic about this. She understands both, you know, worlds as best you can. She yeah. doesn't engage in it. She doesn't try. Like it, it just is stuck to her. Right, right. And, and so if you flash back to the beginning of the story when she says, you know, that her dad prayed for her and she doesn't feel like any kind of God answered his prayers, it's like, what if that Linda woman did curse him? Like, because that, oh, that freaked me out. That woman just standing yeah. there, head yeah, cocked the, back. At the very beginning of the story, that, that weird, like, trance kind of thing. That was, yeah, that was creepy. That was creepy. That's, yeah. a, that's such a creepy thing as a little kid. Like if you just saw an adult do that as a little kid too, just like freeze in a oh weird way and become immobile. And then like- Could you imagine? No, like if, if that, I don't have a memory like of somebody doing that when I was a kid. That, that would have freaked me the hell out. You know that she wasn't there for that, right? Are you getting oh, confused? Yeah, my, I, I am super funky. It was very hard to track just because my brain is about 25% right now. Yeah, so the dad was dating this woman, Linda, yeah. long before he ever met Angela's mom, before Angela was ever born. Got it. So okay, he, okay, okay. Linda curses Angela's dad. There Got is no child at that point. And, and there's yeah, no child present for that, witnessing that freezing. No child even yeah. born yet. Got it, got it, got it. Yep, no yep, child yep. exists at all. Got and so it. it's like the question becomes, did Linda curse Angela's dad and then in... Angela's dad's, you know, pleas for her mother who is supposedly infertile to be able to have a baby. He's very Christian. He's praying like, please let me have a baby. You know, like this yeah. is my dream. Then then this baby comes to life and is the curse transferred from her dad to Angela? Yeah. Did Linda curse him and all his future endeavors? And like yeah. and in the very beginning when she talks about, I don't know, it freaked me out so much. The thought of a baby still swaddled somehow out of its crib, across the room. Yeah. The What? Like, that's not, that is, somebody has to pick up a baby. This was a baby that could not walk yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's insane. Yeah, lots of creepy details. Yeah, so many details. So, um, and no real ending either. Mm -hmm. And doesn't want to tell her boyfriend what's going on. I mean, rightfully so. Yeah. 
Ay, ay, ay. Ichi Wawa. Well, let's get you out of here. Yeah, it sounds good. All right. Do you want me to start with the Annabelle shout outs? Or... Yeah. Okay, great. I'm happy to. We'd like to thank the following Annabelles for making everything we do here so possible, so fun, especially the donations that we get to give each month. Excuse me. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry about that. Annabelle's. Here we go. Gemini. Season Hatcher. Carissa Shaw. Pam. Miss Kitty. May Mayorga. Kyle Davis. Nathaniel J. Kolsch, Stephanie Arandado, Sarah Beth, Madeline Marvin, Pamela Wright, Sadie Lodge, Tiffany Arguello, Ar Arguello Sarah Jean Kane, Chelsea Hammonds, Melissa Ann Morin, uh, Indiana Logger, oh, I spelled this wrong, Indiana Logger, Carmen Roach, Melanie, Joe Riggs, Morgan Castor, Jamie Eckert, Spooky Dookie, David Diggs Jr., and Ali C. Thank you. And uh, thanks to the following Annabelles as well. Chris Clowers, or Clowers, probably Clowers, Chris Clowers, J.D. Driscoll, Shannon Patrice, Candace Dyes, Randy Brocklebank, Nicole Terrell, Jesse Kilpatrick, Slim Shady 666. Nice. Sarah Hunt, Kristen Ginley, Chris, Lauren Moody, Hanene Banene, <laughs> hilarious. Virgil Casanova, Mel Medina, Jezebel, Bell, like Jezebel, uh, Lauren Elizabeth, Mitchell Cooper, William Lewis, Melissa Mini, Kevin Olibari, Jordan Steiner, uh, Miguelie Dionisio, uh, Dionisio maybe, uh, Brandon Bennett, and Jody Knight. Well done. And I have a handful of spooky shout outs before we go. To Tara or Tara, from your big sis, Christy, welcome to 40 Turda. <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. Her name is Tara, and her sister's been calling her Turda. That's funny. pretty great. To Kayla from Ellen, happy birthday. To Kat from Matt, just a thank you. To, Bel oh, to Bella Concha Pantalones del Fuego from Ellie, happy birthday. To my gore, just spooky queen from your nincapoop, Ed Boy, happy birthday. And to Ariana from your fiance, I love you and hang in there. Oh, thanks everybody. And that is another show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death .com. You can email us for everything else info at scared to death .com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Tyler C for the work on social media and to Logan again for running bad magic merch.com. Thanks to Tyler C for producing and directing today, Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing the listener stories for book number four. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans for finding the first story I told this week, and to Sarah Finch and Olivia Lee for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to check out our set, see Lindsay's reactions. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and to see pictures that accompany the episodes at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, with so many horror-loving members. Thanks to our admins and moderators for keeping that up and running and making so many people happy. And you can also follow us on TikTok as well, also at Scared to Death Podcast. Check out special moments, highlights from the episodes. Uh, great way to add visuals if you normally just listen. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and so much more. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. Okay. 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 <laughs> You're funny.